Hey guys, so today I have a cool guest on with me, Ollie Richards. How's it going, Ollie? Matt, it's a pleasure. Good to see you. Yeah, so we just filmed a video on Ollie's channel, talk, kind of talking about Refold and some other interesting language learning topics, so definitely go check that out. And for today's video, I was thinking we could talk about Ollie's uh, 10 rules of story learning, because these are kind of, as far as I understand, 10 kind of rules or principles he's come up with to learn from stories in a kind of smoothly and as efficiently as possible. Now, I'm pretty sure that Ollie created these 10 rules with reading text in mind, but at Refold, we talk a lot about watching shows with subtitles and how that uh, is really beneficial because you, but by being able to hear each subtitle line, first of all, it helps you parse the grammar because you can hear the intonation and stuff. And then also it just helps your listening ability grow along with your reading ability. So I was hoping today we could go through the 10 rules and see how would they apply to the way that we recommend immersing at Refold, which is watching content with subtitles. Yeah, that sounds super exciting. And I'm looking forward to, to, to learning from, uh, from this as well. Yeah, so the 10 rules of story learning. So, so as you mentioned earlier, Matt, my, my method is called the story learning method, and it is a method that is designed to um, to learn a language through stories. It works from the big from from zero from day one, where it's much more kind of structured and guided, and then kind of gets gets you know freer, I guess, as you move up, uh, moves up, move up the levels. I put together 10 rules for this, which have actually been wildly popular among my among my my students, I guess, because as we were talking about on the interview on my channel, one of the difficulties with immersion is actually making the process concrete and easy to understand the different steps. So there are 10 rules and they're in reverse order. So we start with number 10. Okay. Uh, and they're all so important. Honestly, I don't think there's really any particular, it's not like the big reveal is rule number one or anything <laughs> like that. But anyway, rule number 10 is to read at your level. Okay, so say a little more about that. So this is classic comprehensible input which everyone watching watching your channel Matt, will be familiar with. And it's the idea, it comes back to the idea that you learn when you understand messages that you read or hear in the language. On a very simple level, if you are reading stuff that you don't understand, you can't follow the gist of, then you won't learn anything. If you're reading stuff that's far too easy for you, you won't learn anything either. And so to the extent that you can find material that is comprehensible to you, the, the kind of uh, famed comprehensible input, then that, that's where you want to be pitching your, your reading because it's just going to be more efficient than using content at, at different levels. Yeah, so I think that is pretty straightforward to apply to Refold because we talk a lot about finding content that, that is comprehensible. Now, I actually think one of the benefits of watching TV shows is that they're inherently very comprehensible because of the visual component. So even if you're not understanding as much of, of the, the actual text in terms of the vocabulary and the grammar, a lot of times you could watch a TV show with the sound off and understand a lot of what's going on. And so it's inherently very comprehensible. So I think probably the range of, of what you can get away with is a little more. And also we talk about techniques like uh, at the very beginning, you can kind of spoil the plot of a show before you watch it. You can go and read the, the story, the, the Wikipedia summary of a, of a TV show ahead of time. And that way it makes it more comprehensible. So the, the, the fundamental principle of you, you got to be understanding a certain amount of it, first of all, for it to be uh, engaging, but second of all, in order to be making efficient progress, definitely holds true. Yeah, so one of the you know, it, one of the problems with comprehensible input is you've got a, a real practical issue around actually finding that material. So it's all very well for me to say, yeah, you want to read at your level or slightly above it, but it's a totally different matter to actually go and find material that just so happens to be at that level for you at every uh, at every point. You know, so as you get slightly better, you know, you you can't, you can't find material that tracks your progress all the way. So th this is a this is a concept. And what I try and do with my work, with my courses, my books and things is to try to provide that material. But there is a real practical issue of actually having the comprehensible input available. But I totally take take your point on um, on TV shows because it's also got a bunch of features which do make that comprehensibility easier, which is that, uh, you know, TV series tends to have a lot of repetition of different people and, 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 and vocabulary terms and, and things like that. Spoken language is often simpler than written language anyway. And then you've also got um, the different things that you can see visually, which just help help to reinforce all that stuff. Cool, cool. So yeah, then uh, I guess moving on to rule nine. Rule number nine is to focus on the plot. Now, some context for this. This really relates to the way that we, as language learners, will read in a foreign language if we don't have any particular instruction. And what we tend to do, if you've got no language learning experience, what the classic thing that you'll do is you'll pick up a, a book in the language that you are that you're learning and even if it's at the right level for you you start with the first word and then read the second word and then the third word and the fourth word and then the the minute that you come across a word that you don't understand what do you do 
dictionary out, start to read the definition, you obsess over unknown words. This is, it's quite well established that our, that our reading skills that we have in our mother tongue do not transfer across to, to foreign languages automatically. We have to relearn them, things like skimming and scanning. We can do them very well in English, but then we, we have to be aware enough to actually do them in other languages. And so the idea behind rule number nine, focus on the plot, is just to say to you, look, it's okay if you don't understand words, the main way that you're going to make this reading work for you over the long term is by you focusing on the plot, the gist of what's happening, because if you can understand the message, this relates to the comprehensible input, if you can understand the message of what's happening, then you you create the conditions where you can learn. Yeah, I, th I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, this is something I've thought about of this kind of dichotomy of like, do you pay attention to the technicalities of the language or do you pay attention to just the message? And do you kind of delegate the paying attention to the technicalities to your subconscious mind? And Although I, I wish this kind of wasn't the case, uh, I, it seems to be that the most effective learning is when you're disengaged with the story and you kind of de you delegate that, that learning of the technicalities to your, to your intuitive subconscious mind. Because, you know, there's so many Europeans, I'm sure we've all met, that are like extremely fluent in English. And when you ask them how they learned English, they said, oh, I just went on the Internet uh, since I was a kid. I just played video games. I just, you know, played Call of Duty and, and talked to Americans on the voice chat. And when you talk to them about it, they never were trying to learn English. It just happened accidentally almost because they were engaged in whatever they were doing. So when we finally set out to say, okay, now I'm going to learn this language, sometimes you do need to be told to, to not let the technicalities take up too much of, of your mind space. Uh, I will say, because I think this is going to be relevant to, to other, uh, some of the other rules, that in Refold, we created this distinction between free flow active immersion and intensive active immersion where intensive active immersion is when you are stopping very frequently, looking a lot of things up and trying to really stretch your understanding. And then free flow is when you're not looking anything up, you're not really pausing, you're just kind of letting it wash over you. And we recommend doing both, uh, but it, it kind of sounds like what you're saying is leaning more towards that free flow side. But I definitely think it's important to have a big part of that part of the process. Yeah, I mean, a lot of what I try to get across with these rules is to provide a, an antidote to what we could call traditional learning styles, um, which are, you know, grammar translation based, based, based on, on rote memorization, the kind of stuff that you remember from school, right? The reality is that most, most adults, um, the only recollection of language learning they have is from school. And so part of the job that I see I have is to actually kind of untrain them and say, look, there's another way of doing it. So a lot of these kind of rules are blunt force instruments in a way. So yeah, that's, that's kind of how I... I tend to approach it. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like you need to almost overcorrect for the bias that they're coming in with. You do because the alternative is that you get people just repeating old old patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. Cool. So then relate. Rule number eight. It's a very similar concept here, which is door closed, phone off. This this really relates to anything that is that has to do with learning something hard. It is a very simple idea that. If you want to focus on something and concentrate, then you need to create the conditions to do that. And we were all taught this at school, you know, when you're revising for your exams, you know, make sure you have your own study space where you're not interrupted. It sounds so simple. And yet when you look around and you see how people are learning languages, especially with the, prol the proliferation of apps and things getting all kind of quick and easy, they're learning on the train and they're doing it while they're walking down the street and they're kind of, they're distracted. I believe that language learning and the acquisition of language is directly correlated with the amount of focus that you bring to the task. It's not to say that I don't think it's a good thing to kind of fill up your, your train, your commutes and stuff with language activities. Obviously it's better to do that than not, but in general, you want to be spending real quality focus time with your languages. And so that's why door closed, phone off, concentrate. Yeah, that, that is hundred percent applicable to, to a refold. I mean, like, like you just mentioned in refold, we have the distinction between passive listening and active immersion. And with the passive listening, you're doing that during times of the day where you, you wouldn't be able to do focus study, right? Like while you're commuting. So of course, anything's better than nothing. You should do that. But yeah, it's also really important to have focused active immersion uh, time. And yeah, we haven't specifically talked about uh, any, any kind of principles of like, yeah, make sure no one's going to come and bother you or uh, turn off your phone. But I think that that makes total sense. So uh, that that's really helpful. So then how about uh, rule seven? Rule number seven is to learn the script. And um, so this is the script that's in the alphabet or the, the, the writing system of the language. And this kind of relates to a, a long conversation we could have about when is it appropriate to learn the script? There are, you can make arguments for both. People do, they say, you know, just learn to speak, don't learn the script, it'll slow you down. In general, 
if you're going to be learning through reading, then it's in your interest to be literate in the language that you're learning. Therefore, you should learn the script. Now, this obviously differs from language to language. Uh, there are languages like Russian or Greek or Arabic, which have different scripts, but they're fairly simple. You can learn them in a weekend. And yet it amazes me how many people will not do it. And they'll just continue to use romanization. Obviously with Japanese and Chinese, you've got, a, it's the same issue, but on a different scale because learning the script is a, is a humongous task. Yeah. So there is there's nuance there, but in general, this is making the basic point that look, learn the script first. It's going to save you a lot of, a lot of trouble later on. And it's, more than that, it's going to open up a whole world of options and opportunities for consuming more content. Yeah, hundred percent agree. What that's one of the first things we recommend in in stage one of Refold is uh, learn learn the writing system. So don't really even need to make any more comments there. What about uh, rule six? <laughs> oh, <laughs> pretty straightforward. So rule number six is don't look up words. Now this is very much a, a blunt force thing because obviously it should, it should be obvious that, that I'm not saying never never look up words, but the idea of the, the idea behind don't look up words is related to what we were um, talking about before, which is that everyone's default tendency whenever they come across a new word is to look it up in the dictionary. So if the earlier principle was to focus on the plot, that's kind of the, um, the, the, kind of the overarching concept, focus on the plot because if you understand the message, then that's the conditions. Those are the conditions in which you'll learn. Mm -hmm. Then the kind of the subcategory there is don't look up words. And the reason is that, you know, for, for the guy with the hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so if with every, um, every word that you come across, you, it, it's unknown and you look it up, uh, you're going to be uh, in trouble very quickly. Yeah. That that's really interesting because, uh, like I mentioned, we have this distinction between uh, active or sorry, intensive immersion, free flow immersion. And so I think, yeah, that was kind of one of the, the thoughts that we had when we created this idea of free flow immersion is there has to be some time where you don't look anything up and you just allow yourself to be with the language. Because without that, people are going to become so like over -re overly reliant and, and, and addicted to it. Right. It's it's uh, and I even experienced this with Japanese, where for me, even to this day, to a, a large extent, if I come across a word, I don't know, I have to look it up. I can't let myself just like be OK with not knowing. Whereas in English, most of the time I come across a word I don't know, it doesn't really bother me. And so, I mean, it's, it's all about balance, right? Because uh, like, like you said, you, you don't want to be looking everything up. It's going to slow you down too, too much and it can be just be really frustrating. Um, but if you can do it the right amount, I think it can be helpful kind of for the learning. So that's exactly it. It's all, it's all about doing it the right amount. And it's about, it's about getting that balance, right. Um, but it's also kind of acknowledging this tendency that we all have. And even, even like you say, even after, after so many, so many years and so much experience, it's really hard. To, to have the presence of mind to say, hey, you know what? I, uh, I don't understand this word, but that's okay. I'm going to not look it up. I'm going to carry on reading uh, because I know that if I, if I do stop to look it up, then this just means uh, over time, I'm going to cover far less ground and get mm. far, much, far less exposure to the language. Yeah, I think yeah, that, that idea you mentioned of uh, kind of having these blunt force instruments to, to overcorrect for the, the natural tendencies we have, I think that's a, that's a really good kind of mental model that uh, I, I didn't really think so much of before. So so that, that's really cool. How about uh, number five? Number five, I don't think I'm gonna get too much argument for you uh, from you on this one, which is listen while reading. <laughs> this is simply making the point that if you read, well, that's great. But if you read but, and also listen to the recording of what you're reading at the same time, then that's even better um, for, all the, for all the obvious reasons. Um, you, when you see what you hear and hear what you see, you're filling in gaps, you're training your um, your ear because you are uh, you're training yourself to to realize that um, the written word is not the same as the spoken word there are all kinds of features of connected speech that um that, that are just natural for natural in the spoken language but you have no idea about in the written language uh, but you know most 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 obviously of all it's just it costs you no extra time so you know why not be listening at the same time as reading it you you'll remember more stuff will just You'll, you'll find that your brain absorbs uh, language patterns more easily. Um, you improve your, your listening comprehension. So it's, it's basically the closest thing you get to a free lunch uh, in language learning. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that was a great case for why you should watch shows with subtitles uh, <laughs> pretty much. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, obviously, completely agree. I think the only caveat is that at a certain point, 
um, you have to listen without the transcript or take the subtitles off because you know to really get your listening ability to a strong level you have to train your train the skill of understanding without any help just through the audio but up until a, a pretty pretty like high intermediate even low advanced level i think the subtitles are, are yeah just pretty much a free launch yeah and, and I'd, I'd make the point here that the, the method that i that i teach is it is it is designed primarily for these lower levels it's 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 getting someone from the beginning up until a kind of you know an, an upper intermediate level i think in general my method becomes pretty much redundant once you're at that upper intermediate level because i would just simply say well look once you can understand the majority of what you read and here, then you don't need this anymore. You don't need you don't need the stabilizers anymore. It's time to go off into the real world and to spend your time reading books intended for native speakers, listening to um, to the radio and podcasts, and basically trying to create your your life and your interests as much as possible in the language that you're learning. Yeah, so it sounds like very much aligns with threefold. Awesome. So then, how about uh, number four? Number four. I think we might have a discussion about this one, which is read it and then read it again. And so the scenario here is you're reading a, a chapter of one of my short stories, for example, and you get to the end of the chapter. My recommendation is that you go back and you read that chapter again and then again, potentially three, four, five times. Back to back right after. Yeah. Um, I'll say up front that this is a really slippery target because I think that, you know, it's perfectly reasonable to say, to make the conscious choice, you know, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to keep reading. Um, and then, you know, I might read the entire book and then go back to the beginning later and read it again. So this, I think this is aimed primarily at the very lower levels when you're, when you're reading your first book. Um, so I, I often get people that, for example, who read, um, who, who, who read one of these books, for example, short stories in Spanish, mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll send me a message and they'll say, I didn't think it was possible for me to read in Spanish before, but I've just read my first story in Spanish, my first book in Spanish. I, I'm blown away. And I find this very helpful because it helps remind me of the psychology and the mindset of someone who's struggling to find their feet in a language. And the thing, the thing about reading something for the first time is that you're going to, you're going to get more out of it with every pass that you make. So if you, at a very sim simplistic level, the first time through a story might be just listening out for the gist, following the plot. If you then read it again, you're going to, with the, with the crutch of the plot and the plot understood, you're going to be able to notice new vocabulary you didn't, mm -hmm. you didn't notice before, guess the meaning of some of that vocabulary. On the third pass, it's going to be kind of more of the same, but then you're going to start noticing little features of grammar. And so there, as a general principle, repeating the stuff that you're, that you're, that you're reading when you're actively kind of learning the language is going to provide a lot of benefits, but it's not intuitively obvious to people. And people will operate with the idea that, okay, well, once I finish that story, why would I read it again? I wouldn't do that in English. So they would just carry on and read the next story. So I'm trying to make the point that there are huge riches to be found in the repetition of content. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that makes sense. And we have built repetition into Refold in a little bit of a different way. I mean, my experience is kind of that I, I never really like to consume things multiple times, especially back to back. I just found it, it, it just is kind of boring because you, you just consumed it, right? That's the downs, that's kind of obvious downside. Yeah. Uh, but what I would do and what we recommend people to do at Refold is you actively consume things one time, but then you take the audio for it and then you you put that on repeat for your passive listening. So I, I did it I, I did it week by week. So like on week one, I would watch new content. And then for week two, I, I would watch more new content actively, but I'd passively listen to what I actively watched on week one on repeat. And I got a lot of repetition in that way, but it was not so uh, tedious because when you're, you know, commuting or you're cooking and cleaning, you're, you're multitasking. So your standard of, of what needs, how interesting something has to be to be entertained is lower, uh, but, but you can still get a lot of a repetition in. So, but yeah, but another interesting kind of thought that I had is that you said that people, you, you found that people don't, w without being told, don't intuitively feel like repeating content would be helpful. I found that really interesting because I feel like my audience is the opposite way. I think I feel like they want to repeat things multiple times because for them, that is something they picked up from school, right? Of like, do the drills over and over and over, be like a good boy or like a good student. And then like repeat, repeat things, like master the thing by repeating more times. So that's why I lean to the opposite side of people are always like, uh, should I watch this like multiple times so I can master it? And I'm like, don't try to master anything. Just, you know, just take a little bit away from each thing, each thing that you consume. The difference there, though, I think, is that something like a drill is designed to be done in a repetitive way. That's that's the the inherent 
the, the, the raison d'etre of that drill is to be done over and over again. It's a drill. The thing about a story, though, is it's not you know, a book is generally not meant to be read multiple times, especially mm-hmm. when it's a short story. And so it, I think it kind of feels intuitively wrong. But I think I, I think that this this rule in particular, the idea of read it and then read it again, it is, it, is, it is very, you know, it's very much like a bit like naming jelly to a wall. You know, it's kind of there's a, there's a, a whole bunch of caveats. I think also it does depend on on your level as well because the the more you understand the more that you are not going to want to repeat and i think generally as you get higher up you need i I see that i see there being a a shift from beginner levels to higher levels and i often characterize it uh, on a kind of caricature as as a beginner you're going to be you should be repeating everything lots of times but then as you get to a higher level you should be reducing that repetition until you're just consuming content for the pleasure of it and for the and, and for the for the you know for the sake of the of, of the content i think that's generally the transition that 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 happens um but uh, but like you say if you find it boring to be repeating stuff over and over again then you know run a mile because boredom is the is the, is the kind of deadly sin of of mm-hmm. um of learning anything i personally find that i really when i'm listening to um to to, to dialogues that's what i'm doing at the moment for example listening to dialogues in cantonese i find that i actually really enjoy listening to them 30 40 50 times because i i can hear myself i can feel myself picking up new things each time but uh but yeah sometimes it depends on the material like if i've only got uh, an audio and i haven't got the transcript then all i can really do is the only tool i've got then is to listen to it over and over but would i do that if i had the reading i don't know mm-hmm. i think it has to be taken it has to be it's viewed through the lens of, 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 of each individual temperament, this one. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And, and I think another, another just thought that I had is that when talking about TV shows, it might not be as effective to, to watch it back to back because there's there's more air in a TV show. There's more moments where no one's saying anything. Whereas if you if you have a dialogue with an audio, then it's like com- complete. It's perfectly dense from, from a language point of view. So there's there's that aspect as well. I mean, that's also one of the reasons that I think I've never, I've never fully come around. I've always been skeptical of TV for language learning. There is the, the kind of practical fact that I like to be able to see, even if there are subtitles in the target language, I like to be able to see large blocks of text so that I can go back and, and kind of scan and, and, and repeat stuff visually. But also because TV tends to be longer form, it doesn't lend itself to natural repetition because mm-hmm. it's just too damn long. And so being a fan of repetition, that hasn't always jived um, well with me. Um, so I think, I think this, but this is more of a stru- this, I don't think this is a, a disagreement so much over the over the concept. It's more of a structural thing. Yeah, you're using yeah. if you if you're at a different if you're at a higher level and you're watching TV shows, you know, of course you're not going to repeat the stuff. But if you're just learning and you're reading a short story, then I think there's you know, greatly more value in there. Yeah, I could see that. That makes sense. Cool. So then, are we at uh, number three? We're at number three. Number three. Don't study grammar. <laughs> and uh, obviously, obviously, this is a, a, you know, a, another blunt force instrument, but it, you know, it should be obvious what the point that's being made here. It's that everyone's default is to, um, to, to study um, a structural syllabus in a language, which is to say to learn a language via um, a, a study of the grammar. And um, for people who kind of live and breathe languages, it pays to remind yourself of actually how regular people go about this. And you walk into an average language classroom in an average place in the world and all you see happening is a grammatical syllabus with a little bit of speaking spoken drills for example and the number of people the number of students i have who who first discover what i'm what i'm doing and and and, uh, and i'm and i'm encouraging them to, to 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 move on before they're ready uh you know with with stories and things like that and maybe to start trying to speak and and they'll say well how could i possibly speak the language before i learned all the grammar and and so that it's, it, I find it's super important to address that mindset because that's where you meet the average person um, halfway. You know, it's with that, that it's, the, it's this realization that, hey, it's not all about the grammar. Grammar mm-hmm. is perhaps five to 10% of, 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 of meaning that's conveyed in a conversation. The rest is something different. The rest is body language. The rest is vocabulary, um, uh, intonation in your voice, things like that. Yes, grammar is important, but it's not the holy grail. So let's park that and focus on some of the stuff that's going to get you further. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Because, uh, yeah, of course, most people try to learn grammar as if it's like, as if they were learning calculus, you know, like trying to completely master yeah. every single little nuance so that uh, they can handle the test, basically. But yeah, in refold, I mean, there's, two, I guess, two things that, that are different. Uh, well, the biggest thing is, sounds like your method, kind of you're thinking about 
speaking the language pretty early on. That's one of the uh, kind of characteristics of Refull that makes it kind of unique is that we have a very long period where you're just focusing on comprehension and you're not really worrying about speaking the language. And so when, when that, I think that allows us to teach grammar or, or recommend the study of grammar a little more because people already know that they don't have to worry about speaking so much early on. So I think that that loosens things up a little more because I think, yeah, if you were telling people you're going to go speak and study a little grammar, but don't overdo it, that's going to be like, you know, here's a pile of cookies, just stare at it, but don't, don't eat any, you know? Yeah, no, sure. I mean, just, just, just to clarify, like the, um, the, the point about the grammar really is just because it's so, it's so, it features so heavily in people's minds. Um, but with, with, with story learning, we actually will follow a similar approach to you is that we delay output basically indefinitely. Um, it, a lot of people I find do actually want to start speaking. So we kind of give, you know, got, uh, we give avenues okay, for people because okay. if you feel the, the urge to start speaking, I think you should. Um, but as, but as a, as a principle, you know, we, we kind of, we, the, our approach to, our approach to grammar and speaking is here's the story which is the foundation of the of which is the content that you're you're learning with and then from that story hey here is some grammar which you can pull out and, and have a okay, look cool. at if you like cool. and then as and when you're ready you know speaking is kind of there and waiting but it's yeah it's it's, it's essentially um uh, an input based method awesome so so yeah we're pretty much totally aligned i mean yeah so our our biggest caveat is just the point of grammar is not not to produce the language it's just to comprehend the language that's nice yeah there's a lot of things about the grammar that normally would be taught in a syllabus that you can just ignore like when i was learning japanese for anyone who like knows japanese i didn't memorize how to conjugate into the te form i didn't memorize all the different types of verbs there are i just learned okay there's something called the te form it kind of looks like this it has like either te or de and it means roughly this and that was enough for me to identify the te form when i came across it in most cases and just through getting lots of input, when it came time for me to speak, I knew intuitively how to conjugate into the te form, even though I, I couldn't teach you how to do it because I didn't even know how I was doing it. I just knew what it was kind of supposed to be. So that that very basic level of grammar of just there's something called the called this form. It means roughly this. That goes a long way for comprehension because then when you you can identify it, it can yeah. give you a lot of hints. So it, it's just a tool to make it more comprehensible, basically. Yeah, and it also means you don't you can often kind of sidestep the study of that grammar altogether because if you have enough exposure of it over time in a way that is comprehensible, uh, you know you don't need to learn the rule. I mean, the number of, the number of uh, grammar rules I've learned in, in in different languages without ever having studied them is, you know, it's it's the, the majority. When I when I started teaching different languages, I actually had to read up quite a bit myself because I'd learned to use these rules. Um, uh, intuitively, mm -hmm. just through immersion and by and by you know, communicating with people, but I didn't necessarily understand uh, the kind of the, the 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 technical explanation of it. So I had to kind of read up on that stuff. And so I think what people don't realize about about avoid about delaying or, or or how can we how can we call it like defocusing grammar a little bit from the from the equation is that it doesn't mean you're not learning it. It means you probably will learn it just in a much more kind of natural way over time. Yeah, totally. Because like, I, I like Stephen Krashen's model of learning versus acquisition, where learning is conscious knowledge you gain. Acquisition is the language that your subconscious mind has in, has intuitively figured out and, and you can use uh, automatically and na naturally. Yeah. You, you need to acquire the grammar rules in order to be able to use them. And most of them are too complicated and too technical to be able to really work out in real time. It's like trying to solve a math problem in your head as you speak. And so when you're writing, you have a little a little more leeway, you know, you can, you can actually make use of grammar rules. But when it comes time to conversation, you, you need to acquire them. And in my case, uh, in my experience and from what I've read, acquisition comes from understanding messages, not from having abstract knowledge about these rules or anything. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. So are you ready for rule number two? Yeah, let's go. There's zero probability you're going to dispute this one. Rule number two, learn every day. <laughs> learn every day. Does it need any further explanation? Uh, but again, like this is yeah, I know I could see some people probably need to be told that you know if they're if they're brand new brand new to this. That 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 that's that's the thing. It's like on a very simple level, you know, you can you can diagnose someone's struggle with languages by asking, "Hey, how many days did you take off last week?" Mm -hmm. And it's like if the answer is, "Well, actually, I only studied once," end of the conversation. There's, there's no point giving any further further help because you've you're either doing it or you're not. And so, you know, it, it, it is crazy the number of times that you, you kind of, you can, you have a discussion like, you know, someone comes to you for, for help or advice. And it's like, okay, you're asking me about this particular grammar thing. Qu quick question for you. How long did you spend studying last week? Mm -hmm. And that's it, like end of conversation. So 
it just it, it bears it bears spelling out and um, and sort of seeing i actually make these rules into into these posters that people get and, and they can sort of have them by the by their desk so they can keep referring to it. it's like a reminder that did i actually learn today keeps you on the straight and narrow yeah t totally makes sense i mean yeah i think the total amount of time you spend with the language is the number one predictor of of how quickly you're going to progress and so uh if that's number two i'm looking forward to to hear what, what's number one <laughs> yeah so rule number one is to trust in the process it kind of sounds a bit like a, a bit cultish doesn't it it's like just trust me don't question me just, you know don't, don't question me don't you know don't don't ask why just do it so the idea here is you're coming to something very new and one of the one of the features as we talked about of um, learning with with immersion or learning through input is that you don't get this immediate feedback on how much you progressed mm. in the way that you might do in a grammar exercise but oh i got that exercise right tick good i've learned something that kind of feedback is not immediate and it comes not in in minutes or hours but rather in 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 months and weeks as shakespeare would say not weeks and months um and um and so to a certain extent, if you are there expecting that instant gratification that you get from Duolingo or you get from a, from a grammar book, you're going to be causing yourself big problems because it doesn't work like that. It works on over a lot, lot uh, far longer um, periods of time. So trusting in the process is about saying, look, we are learning with a particular philosophy here, and you don't have to you don't have to do this, but if you want to do it, you know how it works. I've explained how it works. Now you've just got to give it time. And trust in the process, which means doing all the things that we've talked about, you know, avoiding looking up words too much, not focusing too much on grammar, turning up every day, reading it and then reading it again, reading it at your level, et cetera, et cetera. And then have faith in the process, not forever, but at least long enough to give it a fighting chance. Yeah, I think that's really interesting of explicitly right, uh, stating that out because I know that it's yeah totally applicable to, to refold as well, where like you said, the, the benefits can be pretty delayed. Also, so many of the principles are counterintuitive, right? They're the opposite of, of what someone uh, might assume would be the case when they're coming to language learning, right? Like being okay with not understanding everything, not not looking uh, everything up, uh, just go, kind of going with the flow, uh, not speaking early on, not consciously memorizing all the grammar rules. And so, yeah, that combined with the delayed uh, results I think it's yeah inevitable that people are going to have a lot of doubt and going to just wake up one day and feel like is this whole thing like bullshit like is this is this really work like did I just get uh, stuck in some some crazy online cult or something yeah so I think yeah by stating trust in the process I also like how you stated it uh, positively not like you know don't don't get caught up in doubt or something but because it's always nice to have more like positive affirmation it kind of normalizes doubt that people might have. Actually, there's a very similar thing in Buddhist meditation where they have this concept of the five hindrances, which are the five things that uh, get in the way of, of you having a good meditation. And uh, I don't know, if, hopefully I can name them all off. It's it's uh, like basically sleepiness, drowsiness or restlessness, craving, aversion and then doubt. So they name doubt as one of the five hindrances. Mm -hmm. And basically, the in my experience, just knowing that doubt is something that happens and it doesn't actually mean anything is wrong. It just means your mind is, is being a mind. That's what minds do. Uh, then that, in a way, takes a lot of the power away from the doubt. You know, like when you find yourself in the case of meditation being like, is this technique really right for me? Maybe I, maybe I need to find a better technique or am I doing this right? Maybe I did it wrong. Maybe, maybe I need to like go get extra help. If you just realize like, oh, that's just the mind doubting, then you can kind of drop it and, and go back in, into the present moment. Yeah, just just like in um we, we in in mindfulness meditation where where the idea is to not to fight or run away from thoughts that enter your mind, but to acknowledge them, be be present with them, have this have an, an attitude of kindness and openness towards them, and then carry on anyway, and kind of you know focus on focus on the breath. This is going to sound really weird to people who aren't into meditation, um, <laughs> but but it's this idea of of not react not being reactive to feelings and emotions, but acknowledging them and accepting them, which then like you say depowers them immediately takes all the heat out of the out of the situation and, and then allows you to kind of remain focused and grounded on what you're doing yeah 100 percent. and i think we can apply that to, to language learning with because i mean you're kind of saying with the trust in the process another way to say it is like it's probably you're probably going to have doubts that's normal doesn't mean there's something wrong with you doesn't mean there's something wrong with the method uh just just keep on going and eventually your doubts will be dispelled naturally because you'll be able to, to have the results to speak for it yeah there's there's one more thing that's highly relevant to that which is the tendency that people have to to really focus on 
the or focus on finding the perfect method. There, there is, there does seem to be a sort of pervasive belief with people that if I can just find the perfect method or the best method, then I'll be able to learn. And this is why people jump from one thing to the next because they are looking for um, the right the right method. But that really is um, is toxic because it is kind of outsourcing the responsibility. It's saying, well, I haven't quite found the right method. If I just maybe if I find the thing that works, that works, then, then, then I'll be okay. Whereas what really should happen is actually turning the attention inward and, um, and, and, and try to discover more about, um, you know, how you learn and your own process of learning, because that's where the keys to the kingdom are is in understanding how you learn best and, um, and then, and then harnessing that and, and exploiting it as much as possible. Yeah. Although, I mean, I think there's a lot of truth to that, but I also would, would say, Got to have a caveat with that, because I think in general that that's something you kind of hear of of like, I mean, some people take that too far and they say all methods work. All methods are good. You just got to find what works for you or like you just got to stick with it. And that's what counts. But isn't that true? I mean, the thing is, you can find you can find people that have become highly fluent by learning through grammar translation. I, I, I set out a challenge on my YouTube channel recently saying, find me, the, find me a polyglot who's learned uh, language uh, fluently with Duolingo. And I've got a bunch of replies. So, so I think like the, 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 we can always find the exceptions to the rule. Yeah. I, do tend to, I do tend to agree, though, that like in general, um, you know, you, you're going to certain methods are objectively better than others. Um, but yeah, it's, like, it's, it's, it's a funny thing, isn't it, where there is this truth that I think it is objectively a truth that once you once you know how you learn, then that is you know undoubtedly the best method. But then if we take you know a cross section of the population as a whole, there are going to be some methods that are going to have a higher success rate than others. Yeah, so I think it's it's all balanced, right? Ultimately, you never want to outsource your the responsibility of figuring out what works for you. You always ha have to be uh, critical. You know, you, you never want to blindly buy into something wholesale, right? You always want to say, okay, I'll. I'll, I'll take what these guys are saying as a hypothesis. I'll see how it works for me. Um, but but I think it's still important to keep in mind. There are objectively better methods and worse methods. And uh, so, and because the results can be delayed, sometimes it might really be a good strategy to find someone who has the results that you want and do what they did or, or take their advice rather than just kind of winging it. Because I think, you know, you could save yourself a lot of time by avoiding some of the mistakes that the people who have come before you have have made. Yeah, I, ab I absolutely agree. And one great way to do that is by watching Matt's YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah, well, anyone who's probably made it this far in the video already knows that. But uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, I, I think that it was really great. We got to cover all, all 10 of those. I think the, the kind of two things that I'm taking away are one of them kind of having this emphasis on on the psychology of, of, the, of a, someone coming into this and trying to help help them sidestep potential traps by counterbalancing the biases they probably have. I think that makes a lot of sense. That's a really good perspective. And also putting a strong emphasis on, on some of the psychological factors, like especially putting, you know, or, or and saying any things, even if they might, they might seem obvious in hindsight, like do it every single day, uh, have tr faith in the process, trust in the process, like the ultimately our psychology determines all of behavior and, and therefore all of our results. So I think it, it can be easy to neglect that, but it's really important not to. Yeah, absolutely. And, and likewise, I, I, it's been really great to have your have your perspective on this. And I and I'm definitely gonna gonna look further into the um into into the whole refold uh, approach to 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 listening because what I what I will say is that listening for me has been one of it's not my never been my strongest point of all the different all the various different skills I've always being weaker on listening than I'd like to be. So I'm looking forward to, to, to learning more about um, what you guys teach around that. Great. So yeah, hopefully we, we can talk again in the future. And uh, yeah, a reminder again, check out the video we did on Ollie's channel as well. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks again for coming on. Awesome. Thanks so much, Matt. It's always a pleasure.